Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think more people will join us so, soon, but we'll, uh, we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is our first webinar after the summer, so we're delighted to welcome everybody back. And we're delighted today to have a webinar sponsored by Hogan Levels. Uh, so this is our second webinar uh, with the firm. We did a great one on supply chain uh, right before the summer. Uh, so we're very happy to have Aline Doussaint, the, the partner with us again as well as uh, Alexander from the uh, US office of Hogan Levels and Handy from uh, AXA. Um, just before we get started, I think you're all very much used to Zoom by now, but as a reminder, please ask your questions through the Q&A box. We'll do, uh, we have you know, a long time allocated to questions at the end of the session, so please send in your questions um, and Without further ado, I'll hand over to Alin. I'll hand over to Alin. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for, for joining today's webinar. It's, it's early afternoon for, for those of you who are in London or in Paris and early morning for US joiners. So thank you all for connecting from, from different sides of, of the globe. We really wanted to, to talk to you about financial sanctions from a, a, um, um, a multi-geographical perspective and also a cross-sectoral perspective today, because there has been so many developments over the past uh, weeks and months, and, and we expect so many other developments coming from of the US, the UK, and the EU on the sanctions front, that we thought, what's, what's better when, when we come coming out of lockdowns? And, and thinking ahead in 2020, 2020 and 2021, taking stock on, on what we think are the key issues that a from, a from a policy level you are going to face in terms of sanctions, compliance and sanctions developments, and what this will mean for, for, for the business and, and, and your compliance structure internally. So I'm delighted um, to be joined today by uh, Alexander Dukic, who is a partner at Hogan Lovells uh, in Washington and, and a dear colleague with whom we work very closely together on, on all sorts of sanctions, uh, policy and sanctions, legal and compliance issues. And, and also Andy Wag uh, from uh, AXA, uh, who has, of course, a sort of uh, practical hat on his head and, and will give great input in terms of, you know, what, what we can expect from um, well, the, the, the business responses to, to those sanctions developments. So we have designed a 45 minute session. So what we wanted to do today, because there has been indeed so many developments, as I said, is, is really sort of having a, a two part uh, webinar, a two part session webinar. Uh, the first one more giving you a, a bit of an update and we, we, we don't have enough time to go into all the nitty gritty of sanctions laws, but really the key issues that we see are surfacing from, from different uh, parts of, of the world on China, Hong Kong uh, in the first instance, uh, the new human rights sanctions regime in the UK, uh, EU especially, but also taking, start, uh, taking stock on what we have in the US on, on this side, um, additional unilateral US and EU sanctions developments. And then the second part of the webinar is more the compliance consideration. What do the regulators expect from you uh, as, as global businesses? What are the challenges that you face when you trade across border in, in terms of complying and mitigating your risk to sanctions compliance? And, and, and leave um, um, 15 minutes for, for Q&A and discussion and a chance for you uh, on the other side of the line to ask as many questions as you would want to, to us as, as sanctions experts. So I, I don't know if we can start uh, right into the, the core of the, of the topic and, and we thought we would, we would start with uh, China, Hong Kong sanctions development uh, from a US, EU and, and UK perspective. And I will, I will leave, of course, uh, the floor to Alexander for the, for the US side who has been, um, well, the first one to uh, respond to those new geopolitical ch challenges from a sanctions and export control perspective. Thank you, Aline, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Uh, as Aline said, the U.S. kind of has taken the lead, for, for better or worse, uh, in these new measures uh, in light of the uh, escalating tensions between the U.S. Uh, and China. And as you may have seen, there have been a, a lot of developments uh, in a number of areas, whether it's trade policy, whether it's um, you know, export controls, but what we are going to focus today uh, are the sanctions, including the financial sanctions, uh, as, as the focus of our, of our topic today. 
Um, and in the sanctions area, what happened uh, most recently is in response to China's passage of the national security law, um, there were two U.S. sanctions developments on the same day, um, being July 14th of this year. Uh, first, President um, Trump signed into law um, a legislation passed by Congress called Hong Kong Autonomy Act, uh, but also simultaneously, the president issued an executive order on Hong Kong normalization. That's executive order 13936. Now, taken together under these authorities, the president has considerable discretion on timing and, and on choice of parties to target uh, for purposes of these new sanctions, let's call them Hong Kong related sanctions. The legislation, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act was passed by Congress with very broad bipartisan support, which means that it kind of signals that, that it, it will have legs, it will last um, even beyond the election cycle. So it's not, uh, it doesn't appear to be a temporary measure um, that, that is viewed as, as purely political. Now it's important to point out that none of these two new measures, either the executive order or the new statute, uh, impose geographically based sanctions uh, that broadly apply to all companies and persons in Hong Kong or, or in China for that matter, right? So th th this is not a new sanctions regime um, like Iran or Syria or Crimea. Um, in contrast, it's, it's more targeted. So as a result, these new sanctions do not prevent non-sanctioned Hong Kong companies or individuals from conducting USD, uh, US dollar uh, payment transactions or otherwise dealing with US persons or companies. That's the good news. Now, what do these sanctions do? Well, under the, the statute, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, there is sort of a, um, a mechanism that is laid out um, and certain steps have to take place. So first within 90 days um, after July uh, 14th, and we are coming up uh, against the deadline soon, the U.S. government is required to identify foreign persons that have materially contributed to um, the, the failure of the government of China to meet its obligations vis-a-vis um, -vis Hong Kong under the joint declaration or the basic law. And once those parties are identified in the report, then the president um, is um, required to take um, action, you know, to sanction the identified foreign persons um, by you know, blocking the, the, their property and interest in property, which effectively would mean designating them um, as, as an SDN, especially designated national, um, and excluding those individuals from the US or prohibiting entry to the US. So it's kind of the visa ban aspect of it. Um, now, the, the other part of the statute also provides that foreign financial institutions that conduct significant transactions with the persons identified under, under this new law may also be sanctioned. Um, and those uh, foreign financial institutions are supposed to be identified you know, by OFAC um, within 30 to 60 days after the initial uh, report identifying foreign persons who are found to have been engaging in, in those activities targeted by this legislation. So as you can see, it's kind of a staggered approach. The term significant for purposes of foreign financial institutions, that the significant transaction is not defined, but based on other uh, sanctions regimes that OFAC has been administering, it's likely that OFAC will use broad factors for determining significance. You may recall you've seen uh, those broad factors uh, appear in um, OFAC's Iran and Russia programs under, under CATSA, Section 228. Um, so uh, the expectation is that the similar kind of similarly worded broad factors will, will be taken into consideration. Uh, now, the, F uh, the, the foreign financial institutions, if if they are targeted under the this particular statute are not going to be automatically uh, considered as the ends, or and they don't have to be designated as the ends, um, unlike the foreign persons um, who are um, who are engaged in the underlying activity. Instead, uh, there is a menu-based approach to the restrictive measures that the president can choose and uh, and pick from and, and impose on foreign financial institutions. And so this sort of also remi uh, resembles a little bit what what you've seen in in some of the secondary sanctions in, uh, involving Russia and, and Iran, where there is a variety of uh, of measures that, that can be uh, imposed uh, rather than the ultimate um, uh, asset freeze measure such as the SDN uh, designation. Now, uh, another important point to keep in mind is that the authority has not yet been exercised under this new statute. So no action has been taken yet. In contrast, the executive order, which as I said, was issued on the same day, uh, 
um, has been used to date. And what does the executive order do? Well, first, it directs uh, the heads of uh, certain US government agencies to eliminate the favorable treatment according to Hong Kong um, across a number of different areas from export licensing to immigration policy, educational programs, and so forth. But the key for us today is that the executive order gives um, legal basis, gives authority to State Department and, and Treasury Department, OFAC, to impose sanctions on foreign persons, individuals or entities, who are involved in adopting or implementing the national security law or other activities that undermine Hong Kong's autonomy. Now, that's kind of the, the main goal uh, and, and who's targeted. But the important part for, for global businesses is that the same executive order effectively also has secondary sanctions reach because it provides authority to OFAC to designate as an SDN any person who provides material support to those designated as SDNs under the executive order or entities owned by them. As well as, and this is kind of new compared to some other orders, um, anyone who is um, serving um, as a member of the board of directors or a senior executive officer of an entity that is that is blocked under this executive order. So either designated as an SDN or, or owned by an SDN and therefore treated as blocked. Um, so the provision of material support we've seen in other programs, but the the board member and senior executive officer um, a capacity is kind of a, is a new wrinkle that appears here. Um, and um, as I mentioned, this has been used on August 7th, OFAC designated Carrie Lam, the chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, uh, and 10 other Hong Kong officials uh, as SDNs under this executive order. And of course, this also um, you know, impacts entities that they own. Um, so what does this mean under uh, primary and secondary sanctions? Well, once designated, no activity with, with US Nexus can take place with these SDNs or any entity that they own at 50% or greater level. And we'll talk a bit later uh, today in the session, what does that mean and how is this OFAC 50% rule applied in practice? But even if the activity has no US nexus, foreign persons who are found by OFAC to have been providing material support to these SDNs or their companies, uh, or who serve on the board or senior executives can also face a designation. So that's the kind of the extraterritorial reach of this um, you know, executive order. And that's, that, those are the developments on the US side. I'll turn it over to Aline on, on the EU side. Thank you, Alexander. And, and I think from, from the slides, the key, I mean, the key thing to, to take away is really looking at the date. So you, you see indeed on, on the US side, it, the response to those, um, to the Hong Kong Autonomy Act started mid-July. And the EU, it took two weeks for, for, for the EU to start talking about it and, and really assessing what, what sort of level of measures it wanted to, to implement both at EU level, but also member states level to respond to these new challenges and, and these geopolitical sort of, sort of issues. And, and on, on the 28th of, of July 2020, what we saw is, is a statement and concealed conclusions, as we call it, with um, when we talk about sort of EU foreign affairs policy, so a conclusion coming out of the 27th foreign affairs minister sort of meeting in, in Brussels, uh, announcing a package of measures uh, um, addressing the, this, the response, the EU response to um, uh, the, the Hong Kong um, security uh, law, but focusing on, on export controls rather than, than sanctions. And that's the key difference when you look at US versus uh, EU and, and also UK is to what extent the EU at this stage has not felt the need or perhaps has lagged a bit more behind the US in terms of responding to, to this challenge by really focusing on export controls rather than designation on, on specific sanctions lists. So in this package that we see, that we saw coming out of the EU that is a non-binding package, it's a recommendation for member, member states to adopt a number of measures. We saw a strong focus on, on product and, and technology that could be used for internal repression and and specific type of, of communication and cyber surveillance um, uh, products. And what the EU said to the member states, to the extent that we know that your companies, your EU exporters are uh, sending and exporting products um, um, uh, from Europe ultimately to Hong Kong, uh, there is a very strict licensing um, um, decision and licensing sort of analysis that needs to be made on, on whether the member state should grant an export control license for this type of products. So, so a different route 
than actually looking at putting on the list specific individuals linked with uh, Hong Kong and, and China in that specific sort of uh, issue or specific uh, entities. What the EU is doing at the moment, it's re reassessing outside of this whole sort of Hong Kong, Hong Kong situation, it's reassessing its, its level of measure vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in a number of different aspects of EU foreign affairs policies. Export control is obviously one of them, and that's what we are talking about today, but also foreign direct investment screening reviews and this type of consideration that are now forming part of a wider EU coordinated approach uh, to to uh, respond uh, to China in this specific context. So what we saw at EU and EU 27 member states level is a number of member state export control authorities either refusing export control license for specific type of products and components that are exported to Hong Kong for end use or arms embargo considerations or um, 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 potentially putting stricter restrictions or, or limiting the amount of export control licenses that it grants for uh, Hong Kong as a, as a destination. And, and last but not least, um, um, the, the arms embargo that is currently in force, as you know, we all, we've always had a, an arms embargo on, on China has been extended to uh, Hong Kong um, um, separately. In addition to that, and I will stop here for, for the EU and the member states, in addition to that, member states have unilaterally decided to take stricter measures, including on their response to um, Hong Kong Autonomy Act law and have decided, for instance, to suspend the extradition treaty that they might have had with Hong Kong or they were in the process of concluding and, and uh, adopted, in addition, um, specific type of targeting measure, for instance, on asylum and migration uh, rights with, with China and Hong Kong. So a bundle of measures that the EU says it is currently sort of um, uh, assessing and might go stricter, but at this stage the key takeaway is more focus on export control restrictions rather than financial sanctions per se. And, and, and I, will, I will leave the floor to Andy for, for more the UK development because the UK, of course, being now outside of the EU, has unilaterally, unilaterally adopted a um, separate package of measure vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hong Kong and China. Okay, so, <clears throat> thank you, Aline. Um, in fact, the UK developments um, are very similar to the EU at the moment. Um, on the 20th of July, Dominic Raab, the uh, Foreign Secretary, he announced that the UK was going to actually extend to Hong Kong the EU arms embargo that had applied, um, as Aline said, for a long time, since 1989, actually, when it was brought in. So the, the China embargo has now been applied to Hong Kong. Um, that does mean that there are restrictions on certain activities, particularly around the movement of arms, um, particularly open general licences that were in place uh, for the movement of such arms to Hong Kong have now been uh, rescinded and they've been replaced by um, individual licenses that need to be sought for those that for that activity they're quite wide actually they cover um, you know lethal weapons uh, equipment for repression and that sort of activity as well so that's that's, that's quite a wide um, embargo but the actual licenses themselves uh, cover a range of goods and sectors um, some things that you wouldn't think sort of just fall within sort of the arms piece but the chemicals cryptographic uh, activity obviously you've got the military and dual use but then you've got things like information security items sporting guns even an anti-piracy so there's, there's quite a wide range of um, measures there that are actually replaced now with the um, what they call a standard individual license um, the other piece um, that the UK did was to suspend the UK extradition treaty um, this is <clears throat> because of the fears that uh, are in place that uh, the um, any extradition of a UK, uh, sorry, a person in the UK to uh, Hong Kong, the fear is that they would actually then be moved on to China, and uh, that was that was of concern. So that has been suspended um, in, indefinitely, um, and. Um, that there are other there are other bits and pieces and other measures that are in there in particular, but they're kind of the main ones. Um, the only other thing to add is that there is an intention to um, extend the path to uh, you may be aware of the path to UK citizens citizenship uh, for around three million Hong Kong people. So that'd be interesting. That's uh, to be in place by early 2021. So um, quite quite a lot of uh, activity in the UK, uh, very similar to the the perspective. So um, I will pass 
uh, well, if we can move on to the next slide, please. And um, I will pass over to um, Alexander. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Andy. And um, I will uh, start off with, uh, with the US side on developments on, on, uh, human, under human rights sanctions. Uh, and we'll also cover the EU and, and UK because that's another area where we've seen uh, activity uh, more recently. Now on the US side, the, the authority has existed um, under the so-called Global Magnitsky Executive Order uh, since December 2017 to target actors, for the US government to ta target actors around the globe engaged either in human rights abuses or corruption related activities. And this authority has been used by OFAC uh, for numerous designations, but most recently on July 31st, um, OFAC designated as an SDN um, a, um, a Chinese company called Xinjiang Production Construction Corp for alleged human rights abuses. Um, and this also implicated a variety of entities. Um, as I understand, it's a conglomerate that, that, that owns a lot of companies. Uh, so because of the OFAC 50% rule, a number of uh, non-listed companies also um, are, are actually have to be treated as SDNs. Um, OFAC issued the general license to authorizing wind down of activities with HPCC that will, and, and its uh, um, entities that it owns. And that authorization, temporary authorization, will expire on September 30th in about two weeks. Now, this as the end designation under the Human Rights Authority uh, comes on the heels of an advisory that was issued on July 1st by several U.S. government agencies, uh, including OFAC and the State Department. Uh, the advisory was, uh, was titled Risks and Considerations for Businesses with Supply Chain Exposure to entities engaged in forced labor and other human rights abuses in Xinjiang. It, you know, obviously it's a province in, in China and the ad advisory um, alerts um, you know, businesses that, that have potential exposure in their supply chain um, to um, either activities involving the Xinjiang region or facilities outside of Xinjiang that, that use labor or goods from Xinjiang um, to be aware of the reputational, economic and legal risks of involvement with these entities that engage in human rights abuses, um, including but not limited to the uh, forced labor um, in the manufacture of goods that are intended for either domestic or international distribution out of China. Um, and specifically, the advisory identified three primary types of, of those um, risks or supply chain exposure, as they call them, uh, to entities engaged in human rights abuses. One is uh, if you are assisting in developing surveillance tools for the Chinese government in Xinjiang, um, the second is relying on labor or goods sourced in Xinjiang or from factories elsewhere in China implicated in the forced labor of individuals from Xinjiang uh, in their supply chains. Um, and third is aiding in the construction or internment facilities used to detain Uyghurs and members of other Muslim minority groups uh, in Xinjiang or the construction of manufacturing facilities that are in close proximity to camps operated by businesses accepting subsidies from the Chinese government. Uh, to subject minority groups to forced labor. So as you can see, this is not really, even though it's labeled as a supply chain risk, but it's not really focused exclusively on procurement from this region in China as activities involving supply of certain products or services to that region or companies in that region can also trigger this type of exposure uh, and, and some of these issues that, that are outlined in, in the advisory. Um, and the U.S. government agencies further went to explain in the advisory that, you know, there, what are the potential indicators of forced labor or labor abuses if you're kind of assessing your, your supply chain or activities with your Chinese counterparties in this, in this region of China, you know, what to look for. And, and they, they flagged lack of um, transparency, you know, using shell companies to hide origin of goods, writing contracts with opaque terms. Um, or trying, uh, conducting financial transactions in a way that it's difficult to determine where the goods are, are produced or by whom. Um, also, social insurance programs, um, where those companies operating in Xinjiang are disclosing high revenue, but they have very few employees that are, um, uh, that are paying into the government social security insurance programs, which kind of indicates that there may be a forced labor for which uh, payments are not made into, into, the, uh, uh, into the social security program. Um, certain terminology, uh, red flags, certain gov government incentives, whether you know, your suppliers or counterparties in China are, are getting um, government um, development assistance um, as part of Chinese government poverty alleviation efforts or vocational training programs. So those are just some of the flags, um, um, including obviously the factory location and, and government recruiters that the US government listed uh, that you should consider as you're assessing um, those risks in your supply chain uh, or frankly, counterparties in, in, in China, uh, because as I said, this is not exclusively focused on, on, uh, on, supply, uh, on supply chain. Um, 
And uh, finally, as the latest example of a very broad approach that the US government is, is using with respect to OFAC sanctions and, and as a tool of foreign policy, on September 2nd, just you know, less than two weeks ago, two members of the International Criminal Court, ICC, were designated by OFAC as SDNs. Um, now, this is pursuant to a brand new authority from an executive order from June of this year that authorizes sanctions and travel restrictions on, on persons who are engaged in efforts by the ICC to investigate and prosecute US and allied personnel for alleged war crimes uh, in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, I think we've gone the full, for, for full circle from focusing on, on human rights abuses uh, around the world and, and, and going after the, the um, abusers uh, with these sanctions to using sanctions to go after uh, actual ICC officials that are investigating um, uh, alleged actions by, by US or allied forces. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aline for EU developments. Thank you. And, and in a nutshell, um, the, the key takeaway from an EU human rights sanctions perspective is we don't have such regime in force as yet. But this is something that the EU has been working on for a for, for few years now. And, and what we hear, this is hot, hot of the press, but, but not confirmed as yet, is the Commission is working on a, the, there is apparently a leaked proposal for an EU wide global human rights sanctions <coughs> regime that might uh, be um, uh, proposed to the Council of the EU for, for adoption, adoption in the next in the next few few weeks. So um, uh, watch out for uh, potential additional sanctions designation. Just a key um, a, a key takeaway from this is as a general rule, as, as I'm sure you will know, the EU did not necessarily la like going for sanctions that are not uh, targeting to a specific sort of country or a specific sort of issue arising in a specific country with these new sanctions, um, um, human rights sanctions development, we see potentially a new era of, of the EU foreign affairs uh, minister taking sanctions much more as a, as a foreign policy tool than, than what it, it wanted to do, what it had done perhaps in the past, and, and going in a, in a direction which is much closer to uh, the US foreign policy approach on sanctions than what we would have known up until now on the EU uh, foreign policy approach to, to sanctions. Um, so this is something that, uh, as you know, the, the Council of the EU is currently under German presidency and, and the German government has been advocating quite strongly, including the context of the response to uh, the Navalny poisoning investigation and the, and the potential uh, sanctions that the EU was considering as in, is considering um, 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 well, vis a vis Russia or Russian individuals linked to that specific investigation. So we would expect that a potential EU designation might um, uh, surface under this new potential EU human rights sanctions regime that is currently being discussed and, and, and proposed uh, in Brussels um, for the EU. 27. But the UK did not wait for the EU to do that. And in fact, one of its first uh, measure under its new independent trade policy was to adopt an independent UK human rights sanctions regime. And I will let Andy sort of comment on this one because it's a very interesting development and, and, and also an indicator that both the UK and the EU are now using sanctions much more as a, as a foreign policy tool that, than what they were doing before. Yeah, thanks, Aline. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's right. Um, so the UK has already um, uh, got this legislation in place um, under its uh, SAMLA powers, uh, the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act, uh, going back to 2018. So under those powers, it brought in these regulations. Um, the, the idea of the regulations, um, they're, they're, they're measures, uh, they're described as measures to deter and provide accountability for activities uh, that a state may carry out within its borders, uh, which would amount to a serious violation of that individual's, and there's various factors, right to life, right to not to be subjected to torture or cruel or in, inhumane uh, activity and, and slavery as well. Um, the, the UK has actually already brought in 49 designations this year under these powers. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty big signal um, that, um, you know, the UK is out there and is, you know, partly, I, I suppose, because of its, its leaving the EU, but it's sort of standing out there and making these designations. Um, and it clearly shows that it intends to, to, uh, to do so uh, going forward. So uh, quite, quite a significant piece there. Uh, I think uh, on to the next slide and I think back to Alexander. 
Thank you, uh, Andy. So one other um, sanctions development on the US side that we wanted to flag, uh, and it doesn't relate to Hong Kong or uh, human rights abuses, is a, a significant change in the State Department guidance related to the um, Nord Stream 2 uh, project. And effectively, this, this um, goes back to, to legislation from 2017, CATSA, Section 232, that uh, provides authority to target Russian energy export pipeline projects. And the statute is broadly worded um, to, to cover um, a lot of projects. But um, in 2017, State Department issued um, what now looks to be very favorable guidance, which made it clear that um, it was only targeting projects initiated after August 2nd, 2017. And that effectively meant that Nord Stream 2 um, and some other projects were, were not caught um, and benefited from that, um, if you will, a bit of a, a carve out. But that has all changed on July 15th of this year. The State Department indicated in its new guidance that it's effectively deleted the, the portions of the prior guidance that limited the focus of implementation of Section 232 of CATSA only to those projects for which uh, a contract was signed on or after August 2nd of 2017, which effectively now expands the scope to include a Nord Stream 2 um, for which um, you know, the project was initiated before that date. And also um, uh, targets not, not just the provision of goods or services, but also you know, any investments or loan agreements that were made um, prior to August 2nd are no longer carved out and will be uh, subject to section 232. So effectively, as a result of this new guidance, it, exp it expands the, the scope of, of the activities and, um, that, that are targeted by section 232 for secondary sanctions purposes. The focus really now is whether a foreign person has provided goods or services or investments or loans in support of um, Nord Stream 2 that meet the statutory thresholds, either 1 million per transaction or 5 million in the aggregate over a 12 month period, any rolling 12 month period, not a calendar year per se, and whether those activities took place on or after um, July 15th. Now, the, good, the little bit of good news is that the, the new guidance does confirm that there would be no exposure for activities that were done prior to July 15th that were cons consistent with the State Department guidance that was in effect at the time. But you have to be very careful about any new activities after July 15th in light of this uh, new guidance. And this is obviously of interest um, to a variety of, of institutions, both um, uh, financial institutions, you know, insurance companies, um, and as well as all the various providers of, of goods or services, um, since the, the statutory language is, is fairly broad. So you have to kind of, have, if you have any connections to, to Nord Stream 2 or uh, TurkStream um, uh, second line, which are both called out in the new guidance, you, you want to assess this more closely. And on top of that development, which was basically a change in interpretation, um, uh, but no, no real new legislation, just a change in interpretation of the pre-existing law. Um, I also wanted to flag that there is a pending new legislation in Congress um, that would uh, you know, impose new um, uh, types of, of, of sanctions or provide authority for new sanctions related to Nord Stream 2. And, and those changes are pending as part of the uh, fiscal year 2021 uh, National Defense Authorization Act or NDAA, which is seen as one of those must pass legislations each year. And so when, when um, sanctions measures are attached to it, and, and we've seen, as you may recall, we've seen this with, with, in Iran context uh, about seven, eight years ago, um, those, those types of provisions tend to actually pass um, because it's, it's, a, it's a must pass kind of a, a legislative vehicle. And what, what is, uh, you know, the final language is because is, is, there are some competing versions on the House and Senate side, but, but um, what this new legislation would target is foreign persons who are engaged in provision of underwriting services uh, or insurance reinsurance for vessels engaged in pipelining activities for the construction of, of Nord Stream 2, as well as, um, you know, anyone who facilitate the provision of those vessels or, or who provide port facilities, tethering services for those vessels, um, and, and any company that provides certification to Nord Stream 2 to begin operations. So there are a variety, uh, a variety of activities that this new legislation would, would uh, uh, try to target. Um, so, uh, and again, it's secondary sanctions reach, so you don't need to have a U.S. nexus to, for these measures to be triggered if they were to pass. Uh, and even if these were not to pass, we still have to consider the existing law from 2017, Section 232 of CATSA, and you have to look at the monetary thresholds to see whether the provision of your goods, uh, your provision of goods or services exceeds those thresholds to be caught under this um, new new um, guidance from the State Department. Well, one last point about this new law is that if it passes, it, it could be uh, made retroactive uh, 
um, to apply dating back to December 2019, which would be a, a bit unusual, but it, it, that's what's currently contemplated by this new legislation. As far as when this is expected to pass, the best guess is sometime in November or December of this year. It's not likely to be before the election. So with this, I'll turn it over to Aline for some EU developments. Thank you. And I don't know if we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Thank you. So just um, two, um, um, I mean, uh, just spots, a uh, high level overview of, of two EU developments that, that A, occurred over the summer, end of July on, on the cyber attack sanctions regime and Turkey that is currently under discussion uh, in, in Brussels. So cyber attacks, this is again one of those new type of EU sanctions program that are not country specific, but more thematic. So I mentioned the human rights sanctions regime. We already had the anti-terrorism sanctions regime at EU level, and we now have a new um, uh, EU sanctions regime that targets um, uh, sanctions over alleged sanctions attacks. So you might remember that in 2017, the EU adopted the cyber diplomacy toolbox to protect the, what it calls the integrity and security of the EU. And as part of this toolbox, the cybersecurity toolbox, the EU wanted to, to be able to use sanctions law as a response to deter and respond to cyber attacks, which constitute a threat uh, to the EU and all its member states or the EU institutions. And we, we had that, that regime adopted in May 2019, but there were no designation that had been made under that specific EU sanctions regime. On, on the last day of July this year, uh, so over the summer, the EU for the first time imposed sanctions on uh, six <coughs> individuals and three entities that were deemed and um, not deemed, that were considered as uh, responsible for a number of cyber attacks on, on the EU and all its member states. And what's interesting is if you look at the list of the natural persons and the entities that are including in, included in this sort of EU sanctions designation, you will find um, uh, Chinese nationals and Russian nationals uh, primarily, and, and specific Russian, one Russian uh, entity and one Chinese entity. So this again, it's an additional sanctions tool that the EU, that the EU now has uh, to, to target specific individuals and entity, not necessarily under the Russian sanctions regime or uh, another type of country specific sanctions program, but more to respond to what it consider a cyber threat to the integrity of, of the EU. So again, something to, um, to continue uh, monitoring because we think that this is going to be potentially uh, uh, used uh, more significantly by the EU and the member states in, in designated, designating sorry, entities and individuals. Turkey, <coughs> sorry, Turkey, this is very much sort of a key consideration, I'm sure for a number of you on, on the phone uh, and, and on the line, sorry, on the webinar. Uh, as you know, there is an escalation going on at the moment uh, between uh, Greece and, and Turkey over these drilling activities that are taking place in Eastern Mediterra Mediterranean. And, and the EU that had already some very limited sanctions adopted vis-a-vis -vis Turkey with two, two um, uh, I think individuals or, uh, designated under the EU under EU sanctions is now looking at a much more comprehensive package of sanctions measures uh, adopted vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. The next step, this is all being discussed at EU27 and EU level. Uh, there are a number of drafts that are circulating um, between the different representations. Uh, uh, what we know is we will know more when we have uh, the European Council meeting on the 24th and 25th of September, but a, a very wide range of measures are now being, being sort of discussed and proposed, which could include um, <clears throat> sorry, listing of ships uh, involved in the oil exploration activities, sexual sanctions uh, on specific type of items that would be or potentially could be used in, in, in the oil exploration uh, activities, specific type of goods and technology transfers that would be targeted under this, this regime, um, EU sanctions regime, uh, potential ban on lending to Turkish banks and industries by, by EU state banks and, and reductions in EU funds to Turkey. 
Turkey and additional travel bans. Um, do not take this, what is on the slide, for granted. This is still being subject to diplomatic discussion. Um, and again, we will know more next week. But if this regime comes into force, um, uh, of course, this will have significant impact for anyone who has operation and trade uh, from the EU um, or the UK, actually, because uh, the, the sanctions regulation will come into force during the transitional period. So it will, will apply in the UK as well. So any UK and EU trade with Turkey will be directly impacted by, by those regimes. And I don't know if we can go to the next slide, please. And then this leads us to the second part of this of this presentation, having gone through sort of the hot topics of, of, e, of EU, US and UK sanctions policy development, we wanted to touch on sanctions compliance. What does it mean to um, having to comply with a ever ever changing sanctions regime, policy developments that will impact your activities from one day to the, to the other. And, and what, what is it that the regulator expect from you as a global, a global business? And we're delighted that Andy is with us today because of course, as a, as a, as a key uh, practitioner in this field and also in charge of compliance uh, policies for, for a global, a French, but a global uh, insurance company has a hands-on approach to these issues. And I will let Andy comment on, on sanctions compliance and practical steps on, on this slide. Thank you, Elaine. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, yes, I mean, certainly from experience on this, this is something that um, I had to do quite a lot of work about, really. Um, you, when, when I came into my team, you know, there's a lot of approaches that were put down to how sanctions were dealt with and all very effective ways of dealing with it, but actually there was no real documented approach there. So if we were ever challenged or anything went wrong, um, there was nothing we could point to to say, well, actually, that's the right way of doing things. Why had we come to our conclusions? Um, a lot of it is based on experience and everything, but I think it's fair to say there's not one out of the box approach that will fit all companies. And there's certainly much more um, to sanctions than just screening exposure to sanctioned entities or, or, or persons. If only it were that simple, uh, then of course it'd be a bit boring as well. Um, so I think that you know your sanctions risks that you as a company need are exposed to, you need to properly assess those and document those. That assessment you know covers things like you know where are you doing business? Um, if you're doing business on an international basis, where are you doing it? What lines of business are you involved in? Um, who's making the decisions, uh, how are those recorded? What's your business distribution or acquisition model? So how do you get the business? Are, are you delegating authority to other people? How do you deal with those controls, etc.? And only from that risk assessment can you really set appropriate controls. And even if you've been doing it for a long time, it's worth doing that because actually you identify that you don't necessarily have the right controls in place or they're not perhaps, or they could actually be refined a bit. Um, and I think it's fair to say that a good risk assessment and controls document is actually a defense and mitigation in the hopefully unlikely event that something goes wrong. It's the piece that you can point to and say, well, look, we were following that. That was a reasonable approach. Um, you know, regulators might not ask to see and assess those documents as part of their routine um, you know, engagement with you. But in, if something goes wrong, I can guarantee that they will want to go and have a look at those documents. Um, and they will help actually determine whether you may have a strict liability point that you've got to cover, but actually uh, it may help you uh, in terms of a, a potential regulatory charge of inadequate systems and controls. So these are important things to, to, to take. And the risk assessment also helps you determine things like your client due diligence that you need to undertake. When do you need to do enhanced due diligence? When is simplified due diligence appropriate? And what is your screening frequency? Um, you know, you do it weekly, post bind, uh, post client acceptance, or do actually do you need to do screening pre bind um, and overnight screening, for example? It may, you know, it, it may vary. What's the training you need to undertake, for example? What guidance do you need to give to the business, particularly if you give to the first line certain defence activities? Um, and how do you escalate issues within the business? Um, so again, coming back to that clear delegation of responsibilities. Um, 
the, the, the other thing to say with in all part of this assessment is your controls should regularly be regularly audited. It gives you comfort. I know an auditor, uh, nobody likes to deal with internal audit department necessarily, but it is actually a very, very useful tool to determine actually do you need resource in certain areas? Sometimes getting the, you know, a finding on something can be quite a useful thing to do as well. Um, other elements that come out of it are clarifying how you deal with regulators, your external advisors, the lawyers, for example, and how do you report issues to authorities. So without what I call those framework documents in place, um, you might not necessarily have a breach of uh, sanctions or a regulatory finding, you may be lucky, you know, but as I say, if a breach does occur or those documents are woefully inadequate, then um, I think you can expect that the regulatory response could be fairly robust. So um, it's an overlooked piece, I think, from time to time. And as I say, we do work on intuition and our knowledge of how all these things work, but it is worth spending the time and putting these things in place. Um, so that's just my comments on some practical steps that hopefully would be helpful for the future. I shall hand over and on to the next slide, please. Thank you, Andy. So I'll take care of the sort of the infamous OFAC 50% rule and this hopefully slide um, will try uh, illustrate for you how the hit applies in practice and, and we're sparing you the suspense and giving you the answer right away. And some of you who may have um, heard me talk on this topic before have seen this before, but uh, I think it's a helpful um, reminder for, for everyone to, to understand how U.S. sanctions flow down because it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, so let's say for the moment that Mr. X, who's on top of this kind of uh, corporate ownership chain, is the individual who becomes designated by OFAC as an SDN, okay? Um, Mr. X is, is the only person that is on the OFAC list. None of these other companies, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are actually on any U.S. government list. Yet, as a result of Mr. X's designation, you have to treat all of those companies in red as SDNs. That's how um, broad these, the, 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 the kind of the application of 50% rule is. Um, and that, it also shows that oftentimes automated screening is a great uh, way to, to address compliance, but it, it doesn't get you all the way home. So you really need to understand who you're dealing with and maybe consider some other uh, steps, whether it's a you know, certification or a contractual language or other ways to protect yourself. And let me show you just kind of why it works this way in practice. Okay, so A clearly is uh, sanctioned because it's 50% uh, or more owned by Mr. X directly. That's fine. That's easy. But um, a lot of you may be looking at C and saying, wait a minute, uh, Mr. X does not own 50% in C uh, because he owns indirectly 40% interest in C. And you may be right if you're looking into kind of the typical kind of corporate analysis and dilution of interest. That's not how OFAC looks at the application of the 50% rule. Instead, you do a step-by-step -step analysis, no dilution of interest as you go down the chain. So it's a more of a cascading waterfall analysis. Once you determine that A has to be treated as an SDN because of Mr. X's direct ownership interest, then you look at who does A own at 50% or more. Uh, and that's how you end up with C being sanctioned. Now, um, you may say, well, okay, fine, but what about D? D is not owned at 50% uh, by A, so why is D sanctioned? Well, another principle, in, in addition to this kind of waterfall analysis that you do step by step without dilution, another principle that OFAC uses is uh, called aggregation principle. So you have to combine the interests, uh, equity uh, interests held by um, two sanctioned parties to, to see whether uh, two or more sanctioned parties to see whether 50% threshold is reached. So, so in our case, both A and B uh, have to be treated as SDNs because of the direct ownership being 50% or, or more. And then when you look at A and B together, they own 50% of D and that's why D has to be sanctioned uh, as well. So again, just shows you, you, know, if, you if your counterparty approaches you and you're dealing with company G or F, for example, and you, you run them against the government list, you're not necessarily gonna see any hits because they are not designated. But when you look at the, the ultimate ownership, you have to treat them as sanctioned. Uh, and this is important both for primary sanctions purposes, if your activity has any US nexus, because you could be in breach of primary sanctions. And also it's important on a secondary sanction side, because if you're dealing with GRF, uh, you may be exposing potentially yourself to uh, secondary sanctions risks, even if your activity has no US nexus. Next slide, please. So Aline can tell us about the, the change, uh, the difference in approach on the EU side. 
Thank you. Yes, and and quickly because we want you to leave room for for questions. Uh, the EU, and I'm I'm sure you will you will you will know that if you're well versed in in sanctions compliance um, uh, from your day to day activities. But of course, the EU applies the ownership tests, and and that ownership is similar to what Alexander was describing in terms of the 50% uh, rule. So if you have an entity uh, that is not on the list but that owns sort of you, through your research, you know that the majority owner of of that specific entity is designated. Well, both entities become designated. That's valid for both EU sanctions, but also UK sanctions laws. Um, and in fact, the example that you will find on the ownership test um, section of this slide is, is directly taken from the guidance from OPSI the UK sanctions regulator on that specific point. One, the, the key important um, uh, element on this slide and, and the key takeaway is, is, is this control test that is one of the key difference in, in EU and UK sanctions laws vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the US ones because the EU um, um, actually on this specific issue is actually stricter than US law and, and it asks uh, companies to look, uh, it, it asks sort of um, uh, one has to look broader than 50% and look if there is any potential minority interest that relate to control and that would um, uh, designate a specific entity through uh, the additional element of control. Uh, this control test um, is quite difficult to implement in practice, as I'm sure you know, especially when you're dealing with um, cascade of, of shareholding structure with, with sometimes sort of shares that are difficult to pinpoint to specific individuals or entities, as, as I'm sure if, you, if you've had to deal with EU um, sanctions compliance vis-a-vis -vis Russia, this is one of the key uh, tests, the key difficulty in assessing who owns what and who controls what from an EU sanctions law perspective. What the EU has is this sort of of, uh, five uh, bullet points that have I've sort of uh, copied and pasted on that specific specific lines that slides that are coming out of an EU guidance on how to apply the control test and that it, it asks you to basically it's, it's a case by case analysis and based on sort of the, the factual the factual element of, of each of a specific set of case but you you, you would have to look as whether you have um, um, you have a specific entity or an individual who has right or can exercise the power to appoint or remove a majority of members of specific boards uh, you have to, to look at uh, the, the shareholders or members voting rights to assess whether the control test um, is actually met, uh, dig through potential articles of association or memorandum to assess whether even if one has 20% of uh, ownership in a specific entity, it exercises control under the specific sort of control test element. So it's a very difficult, um, it can be a very difficult element of EU sanctions law to, to implement. Uh, and it also always goes back to uh, which national law is at stake, where the entity is incorporated and, and going back to the company law of that specific country, uh, EU country, to, uh, to assess whether uh, one would think that the control test is met. And, and, and if it is, then you would have to um, consider that the entity is also subject to designation by way of being controlled by someone who is, who is on the list. Uh, so that's that's a key a key criteria from an EU sanctions perspective, and and perhaps we can go to the next slide. Very quickly, and then uh, perhaps I will I will leave uh, to to Andy to comment on that. What we wanted to do on this slide is, of course, sort of we have a myriad of of regulators. Uh, the main ones that are in discussion today are really US, UK, and and France, uh, uh, and all of those regulators might expect different sort of might have different compliance expectations. And that creates, of course, difficulty for sanctions compliance officer in terms of assessing and adopting a global compliance program that meets all the requirements from each of, of those regulators. Uh, I'm sure you are well versed into the, the US OFAC compliance framework, which is, of course, the most sophisticated one when you look at sanctions compliance. Uh, and I will uh, let Alexander comment on that. From a UK and a French perspective, uh, we have that sort of duality of regulators that sometimes makes things a bit a bit more complicated for sanctions compliance officer because if you are a regulated person of course you have to look at what the FCA from a UK perspective 
or the SCPR uh, from a French perspective would expect from you uh, in terms both of AML, CTF and sanctions compliance sort of um, uh, expectations. And in, in addition, you would have to look at what OFC in the UK from a UK sanctions perspective or uh, the DG Trésor in France from a, from a pure French sanctions, sanctions perspective um, expect also from, from anyone in, within that jurisdiction uh, when it comes to sort of complying with financial sanctions. Um, uh, I don't know, Alexandra, if you want to comment quickly on, on the OFA compliance framework and, and then perhaps Andy on, on more the global, the, 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 the practice um, perspective on, on those. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Just a quick point that um, the five pillars that OFAC uh, laid out in the framework are listed on the slide, and, and it's helpful for, for especially for legal and compliance teams that to, to have yeah, the first pillar being senior management commitment. This framework lays out what is the expectation, what does that mean to have a senior management commitment. So it's usually helpful for your internal communications purposes uh, and carrying the message uh, uh, to the C-suite. It's, it's, it's helpful to point to that. And other, other pillars are actually were covered well by Andy in, in practical and plan steps. You've heard about auditing, testing, procedures, risk assessment, and training. So these are all key elements of your compliance program. Andy? Yeah, the only thing I would add is um, when I think of the different regulators here, I, I, you know, and I'm making a regulatory assessment of the risk that I have, as it were, when I'm dealing with a regulator, you know, there is a different approach to all of them. The, the US is very active in what it expects of its nationals, but interestingly, also what it expects of foreign nationals as well. So it's a sort of a different approach. The UK is much more sort of principles based, uh, tends to get involved if something goes wrong, but tends to leave that to you. Whereas France, from my experience also, is a little bit more like the US in the, ten, in, in the tendency that it will come and visit, particularly if you're big enough, and it will come and test and review your controls and look at the documents. So there's sort of different approaches there. So that's part of the consideration. At the end of the day, framework documents I refer to would help you in all of those cases, but there's some helpful tips there as to what the framework should look like. That's it, thank you. And, and I think we have a couple of, of questions that perhaps we can we can try to, to address. So I will I will try to allocate um, a couple of them. Uh, Andy, I mean I think there is there is one that is more, more for you from from a business perspective in the impact of, of chi Chinese Hong Kong sanctions for for a global business like like AXA. I don't know if 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 you can or if you want to comment on 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 how you had to deal and and sort of perhaps um, implement new controls for 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 China and Hong Kong as a result of uh, those those new sanctions and export control restrictions that we've seen coming out recently. Yeah, um, I, I, I think we certainly saw that as a very significant uh, step by the U.S. Um, it sort of seemed to be ramping up. Um, to another level. I know we've seen the ICC and I think that's almost a bit like a, you know, a similar situation. It kind of takes it onto another level. Um, because of our international exposure and others have got international exposure as well, when you see this sort of activity happening and you know, interaction with the you know, former um, uh, you know, sort of colonies it with the UK, the ties that we've got there, that activity, the US, this China, it's one you have to sit down and really you know, kind of work it out. What does it mean? Not just have you got any exposure to any of the individuals, that's one thing, but actually what do you think might be happening next? So we've spent an awful lot of time to sort of say, what is this? What's going on? What's the basis behind these sanctions? And try to work out, because it has some impact on you know, business strategy and what you might be doing in those areas as well. So um, you know, without going to the specifics, obviously I'm not going to talk about our own uh, exposure, but, but, but it's a, you know, I think for people there are international businesses and do have exposures in those territories. It's an important one to sort of say how, what is happening there? What might come next? What could happen? Um, and and I, I think that's all I would say uh, is that it's a significant piece and it's had us spending quite a lot of time, you know, working over and talking to our council and everything and, you know, working out the exposure. So significant sanctions. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. And, and I think there is one more for, for you, Alexander. It's more a crystal ball type of question uh, on the US election. Do you anticipate that the US will ramp up their approach to China in, in, in the ramp up to the November election and whether the election mean anything from a sanctions, sanctions policy perspective in the US? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. And I, I think it, it's probably safe to assume that we will see additional China-related measures, additional tightening or escalation 
bet be between now and the elections in early November. Um, I, I don't think that that will be a surprise to anyone. It's really hard to say what exactly are we going to see. Uh, as you may have seen, we've, we've also had some targeted measures focused on certain companies, whether it's uh, ByteDance, the owner of TikTok, or whether it's uh, Huawei, um, or, or whether it's uh, you know, WeChat and, and, and Tencent. Um, um, so it could be company specific. Um, I, I mentioned some of the designations in the Xinjiang province. Um, but also, it could be a bit more broader measures that we've seen on the sanction side vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Hong Kong or on the export control side. So it's really hard to say exactly what, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that it's not a surprise that, that, that we should see some more um, escalation before November. After the election, depending on, on the results, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's anyone's guess, obviously, who's, who's going to uh, be in office uh, uh, in late January. But... Uh, in either case, um, you know, the, the, the sanctions as a tool of foreign policy is here to stay. It's been used extensively both by the, the Bush administration and the Obama administration and, uh, and of course, the Trump administration in the early uh, first uh, um, installment. So um, I, I think sanctions we can expect to see as a tool continue to be used, uh, whether it's going to be China as a primary target or Russia as the primary target, that that may depend on, on the outcome of the elections. But but. Um, uh, Hang on for the ride. Sanctions are here to stay. And and I think that's that's all we have time for for, for today. Um, so um, I, I see we have a lot of questions, and we'll try to come back separately with with responses on on those. So thank you to everyone for for joining the the webinar, and uh, we hope you you will have found it helpful. And again, thank you so much, Andy and, and Alexander, for for joining me today for for this specific one hour on on, on sanctions, sanction policy, and sanction compliance. Thank thank you all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you so much. Okay, you Thank said you. everything. Uh, we'll share the answers to your, well, your answers to the questions in, our, in uh, the thank you email that will go uh, very soon. Thank you all. Thank you again, Eileen and our speakers, and we'll see you soon.